Hi, Tom and Nancy. This is Lori Gruen. I wanted to tell you a little story. When I was in graduate school at the University of Arizona in the fall of 1984, I was interested in animal activism. I was actually more interested in animal activism than in studying for my PhD in philosophy. My professors weren't thrilled to see one of their new fellowship students appearing on the front page of the campus newspaper being carried off by police from a protest that we did at the medical school protesting experiments on greyhounds. The chair of the philosophy department at that time said that I had to make a choice, either study philosophy or be an activist. And I left graduate school in January of that year to go work for PETA. In those early days of PETA, there were just a few of us living in a house in Bethesda. I think at some points I just slept in one of the offices on the floor. But as we grew, we moved to the warehouse in Kensington, and, and I was working at that point nonstop on the University of Pennsylvania head injury case, and I was traveling between Bethesda and Philadelphia. In the summer of 1985, I helped to organize the sit-in at the NIH that ultimately ended up having the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the funding for the Generali Baboon Head Injury Lab. This past summer, a group of us from the sit-in met in Washington, D.C. to mark the 30th anniversary of that amazing victory, one of, I think, the most significant victories for the animal rights movement. And while this was certainly an important victory for animals and for the movement, really catapulted the movement into, I think, some a whole other type of protest movement, it was also important, I would say, even transformative event for me because, Tom, you were one of the people at that four-day sit-in, and you were both a philosopher and an activist. And so that you were there, sitting in with us, was really a genuine inspiration for me. I realized I could eventually go back to graduate school, and that's what I did. Got my PhD in philosophy, which is also what I did, and become a scholar and stay an activist. So thank you for all the good work you've done, Tom and Nancy. Thank you for all the people you've inspired. Thank you for inspiring me. And importantly, thank you for all the animals you've helped, and particularly in showing us all that they're subjects of lives, lives that can be dignified and lives worthy of respect. And with my deepest respect and gratitude, I celebrate you. This is Carol Adams, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to talk about the grant I received from the Culture and Animals Foundation. It was 1988 when I applied for and received the grant. The grant was for completing the manuscript that would become the sexual politics of meat. I remember opening the envelope and staring at the check for several minutes, thrilled, speechless. By 1988, I had been following the thread of the idea I first had in 1974, 14 years earlier. At times, it felt like being in the labyrinth with the Minotaur. I was not there to slay the monster, but to understand and describe what I believed about human-animal relationships. Knowing what I wanted to say and knowing how to say it are two different things entirely. And as I wandered in the maze of ideas, I often dropped the thread and lost my way. By 1988, I had written three very different drafts of my manuscript, but I was very excited because the most recent draft reflected the revelation I had experienced about how animals and women were absent reference in a patriarchal culture. This insight was the thread that seemed to promise a way out of the labyrinth, I knew what I had to say, and I now knew how to say it. The chapter in which I introduced the concept of the absent referent is one of the chapters I submitted to the Culture and Animals Foundation in my application for a grant. Not too long after, I received a letter from Melinda Vadis. She had been asked to evaluate the chapter by Tom and Nancy, and she was writing to congratulate me on the chapter and to share some of her thoughts from her own philosophical work. I guess it's okay to admit now, in public, to Tom and Nancy and others, that this letter was the first to arrive. Melinda's enthusiasm was such a wonderful sign. At that moment, 
what it said to me was that I was on the right path. My ideas had touched a stranger, and she was responding to them. Melinda and I would correspond for many years, and her quote, Meat is like pornography. Before it was someone's fun, it was someone's life, is the epigraph of the pornography of meat. A few days later, the check from Culture and Animals Foundation and a letter from Tom arrived. The unbelievable had happened. This was a respected foundation, and a famous philosopher was writing to me about my work and giving me money as well. For several days, I did not cash the check. Instead, each day found me simply staring at it, encouraged by its sight. With the funds from the Culture and Animal Foundation, I covered the cost of a research trip to Austin to the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas to read Joseph Ritson's 1802 book, An Essay on Abstinence from Animal Food as a Moral Duty, and which I discuss in Chapter 5 of The Sexual Politics of Meat. I was only about one-fourth of the way through the book in the library by the end of the day. It was catalyzing so many thoughts I had to stop and write notes about it all the time. But I did not have the time to stay for an extra day at the center. So I splurged and ordered a microfilm copy, and once home, took a lot of quarters to Southern Methodist University's library, where you could print out microfilm, one page, one quarter at a time. And I would... And I could, because I now had a research budget. I am thankful for the Cultural and Animals Foundation's generosity in supporting me. The grant helped me with my next steps in completing the manuscript. But even more importantly, I am thankful for their witness, their encouragement, their confirmation that I had found my way. A year later, the Sexual Politics of Me won a Women's Studies Award from Continuum Publishing, and at the end of 1989, it was published. I was out of the labyrinth. Working as an editor with Tom Reagan, especially an animal-loving editor, should be thought of as a dream job. And indeed... It was. It entailed reading manuscripts that were intellectually appealing on subjects of social importance by someone who is at or near the top of the list of the best writers with whom I have worked. Besides his individual writing, Tom created the series Ethics and Action for Temple University Press. Besides finding authors for the individual volumes, he worked in environmental ethics and feminism were among the subjects. Tom worked with the author until the manuscript was completed and ready for publication. As a scholar of the philosopher G.E. Moore and author of Boonsbury's Prophet, Tom is highly regarded in his field. He is virtually revered by those concerned with issues regarding animals, and rightly so. Tom Reagan has been at the forefront of the campaign for animal rights for decades. My own associations with him go back 25 years. That was when my first book, The Souls of Animals, was published by Stillpoint, a small press that had also released John Robbins' Diet for a New America. At the time, Tom was good enough to pin a blurb for the back cover. Gary Kowalski's voice is one that empowers us to say in public what we've thought in private, that animals love their companions, know grief and joy and play and create, They are truly our brothers and sisters in fur, feather, and fin. He did a foreword for the second edition of the book six years later. It's amazing and gratifying to me that this volume remains in print and continues to sell a quarter century after its first appearance. When The Souls of Animals first appeared in bookstores, this was long before Amazon or the Internet existed, Many of its assertions were far from being generally accepted. 
In the opening chapter, for instance, I described how elephants grieve their dead and cover the bodies of their deceased with vegetation similar to a human funeral. The editors at still point were incredulous and concerned that I might be fabricating material, demanding that I fact-check and authenticate each of my claims. Twenty-five years later, it's become common knowledge that other species mourn the loss of friends and family members. For instance, PBS produced an entire television series recently on the emotional lives of animals that repeated and mainstreamed many of the same points that were controversial in 1991, that animals dream and make music, appreciate art, display altruism, have a moral sense, and possess self-awareness, as well as experiencing loyalty, love, and most of the other qualities that are at the heart of our own humanity. How have ideas that were considered avant-garde or even outlandish 25 years ago come to be part of the public domain? Much credit must go to Tom and Nancy Reagan and their Culture and Animals Foundation. I was first invited to speak at their annual Compassionate Living Festival in 1992 after the souls of animals began selling tens of thousands of copies. Then I was invited back in 1997 when I delivered a lecture that would become one of the principal chapters in my later book, The Bible According to Noah. These festivals brought together individuals from disparate fields, academics, artists, filmmakers, religious leaders, activists, veterinarians, and nutritionists, who were outliers within their own disciplines but through creative interchange began to form the core of opinion makers needed to bring compassion for animals from the margins into the central arenas of policy making and popular discourse. They helped to support people like me, helping us to see how we were part of a larger, more legitimate movement with the force of history, logic, faith, and beauty on our side. As I reflect on this last quarter century, I see both the progress and the problems remaining. Attitudes towards animals have changed, but modifying personal and corporate behavior has been slow work. Who will be the next Tom Reagan who will combine the intellectual rigor and personal passion and generosity of spirit to lead us toward a world where Animals are no longer considered commodities, foodstuffs, or resources for the taking, but beings who have their own integrity and rights to be respected. Tom has sown seeds of untold good that continue to grow. It's been a privilege to work alongside him preparing the soil for a harvest whose day will surely come. Hi, Tom. Hi, Nancy. It's Gary Francione. I want to thank Martin Rowe for inviting me to participate in this webinar, and I want to say as a preliminary matter that we have six canine refugees living with us. If they are quiet for the duration of this recording, I will be nothing short of amazed. Uh, so if you hear a noise, I apologize. Tom, I was thinking about the first time we ever spoke. It was either really late in 1984, really early in 1985, and I called you at home to invite you to come to speak at a rally we were planning uh, for April of 1985 to protest the head injury experiments that were going on at the Penn Medical School under the direction of Dr. Generelli. And so we, were, we, we had something called RAGE, the Rally Against the Generelli Experiments. And I called you to see if you would come and speak. And I don't remember how I got your phone number, your home phone number, but I called you and you answered the phone. And I introduced myself, and you said, yes, you had heard about what I was doing at Penn and that you were entirely supportive. And uh, I asked if you would come and speak, and you immediately accepted, very graciously. And we had a conversation. I don't remember what we talked about. I just remember we had an, uh, a very nice conversation. And uh, that was the beginning of, uh, of an interesting relationship. Uh, I, I hope you'll agree. But, um, and then we had the rally in 1985. You, were, you stayed with us. Uh, we were living in Cherry Hill, New Jersey at the time. Despite the fact that we were living in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, you stayed with us. And we drove in to, uh, to Penn that morning. 
and we were in my office for a while, and I believe Jim Mason came and joined us because he also spoke at the, um, at the rally. And then when the time came for us to walk over to the quad, we walked over, and the three of us, and actually Anna was, it was the four of us because Anna was with us, and I'm trying to think who else. There were other people with us. I don't remember who they were, um, but there were other people with us, uh, and we walked over to the quad, and uh, we were absolutely amazed at the size of the crowd. You know, we were hoping for at most a couple hundred people, and the, and the crowd was huge. And um, it was a wonderful event. The energy was terrific, uh, and I think we all had the feeling that something important was, uh, was going on and, and that um, there was a change, there was a shift um, in, in terms of um, the way people were thinking about non-human animals. And it was certainly the first time something like that ever happened at, uh, at a place like Penn or indeed any other, any other uh, major university. Um, and then we had the, the, the uh, sit-in uh, in July of 1985. Uh, when you, along with uh, you know, 99 other people, I mean, it, was, it was roughly 100 people who occupied the, the NIH, um, and I remember uh, it started on Monday, July 15th, and in the afternoon of, of that day, I got a call from the, the, director, of the, the director of security at the NIH, uh, and um, he asked me if I would come and... Uh, and, and uh, represent basically the sit-in, the, 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 the demonstrators who had occupied, who had taken over the building, building 31 of, uh, of the NIH. And, um, and I accepted the invitation to come down and, and uh, be with you all. And I jumped in my car. I drove down. I remember I got there early evening on, on uh, Monday, July 15th. And um, Tom, I have to tell you, uh, I think, I mean, those were uh, three and a bit days that were um, some of the most intense times of my life in terms of it was just um, constant negotiating with, uh, with the NIH people and going from one meeting to another to another to another and dealing with all of the issues that were, uh, that were coming up with the demonstrators and whatnot. But um, your presence there was, uh, was absolutely, uh, uh, you, you kept it together. You really helped uh, uh, folks keep it together, and I remember uh, walking out of a meeting I had with um, with the NIH people, and I I was walking down the hall, and I passed this this room where you were sitting with I don't know 30, 40 people, and you were having a discussion. You were leading a discussion on animal rights with them. It was just wonderful, and um, you really you really um, were were key to the success of that event. On the on the uh, morning of July eighteenth. Uh, we, um, we were told that uh, the director of NIH wanted to meet with me and um, several other people. And, uh, and, and frankly, I thought I was going to be told that all of the demonstrators were going to be arrested. And in fact, I was told that sec then Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, Margaret Heckler, had looked at the, at the uh, videotapes of the head injury experiments and had directed a... Um, an investigation. She was temporarily closing the lab, and she directed an that there be an investigation, and um, and then we had that huge press conference on the on the grounds of Building Thirty One uh, when we uh, when we left the building and talked about the uh, talked about what had happened and the fact that we had a victory. We had actually su succeeded in at least temporarily shutting down a um, a, a major. Uh, a, a, a laboratory at an Ivy League university. That was, uh, that was a first-time event. And um, they did an investigation, and they ended up finding that Penn had, um, Penn had acted improperly. And the, um, the head injury experiments stopped, at least with non-human primates. Unfortunately, they started up sometime after that with, as I recall, guinea pigs uh, and, and squid. I, I, I don't really remember. Um, I, I do know that they started up again. And um, the... Uh, Actually, it was it was an issue because the a lot of the animal people were just simply not had lost interest because it wasn't primates anymore, which was really sort of sad. In any event, um, but those were th that was the beginning of our relationship, Tom. And uh, you know the 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 rally in April of '85 and the sit-in in, in July of '85. And I remember you and I drove back um, from Washington. You came to our house and you stayed uh, that weekend, as I recall. And we 
we drove up and we stopped on the New Jersey Turnpike because there was a stray dog running around. And I remember you and I were chasing through fields on the uh, New Jersey Turnpike to try to get this dog. And I don't remember what happened. I think actually somebody came along um, whose dog it was and, and the, you know, the, the dog had run off. And, and that's my recollection was that we, we got the dog reunited with um, his or her human companion. And then we went back to our house in Cherry Hill, and you stayed that weekend. And, uh, and that was just uh, a heck of a time. But, um, and then, then I was thinking it was probably either the, what well, it, it had to be probably a year or two years after that. I mean, obviously, we, we, were, we were in contact all that time. But the thing I, one of the things that was really important to me was you sent me a note. It was a very short note. And it had to be probably 80, probably 86, 87, probably. I was in a different, I, I remember it had to be, it couldn't have been uh, much earlier than that because I had switched offices. And I remember I got this note when I was in my second office at Penn. And it was a short note. And it was a note, note in which you were uh, pointing out to me that you were concerned that so many of the adv advocacy groups were embracing Singer's philosophy. And, um, and I remember I called you and we talked and I said, yes, I was concerned as well because I thought that uh, the rights welfare distinction, which really nobody was talking about at that time, uh, had tremendous implications. See, I told you we were going to hear some barking. Um, had tremendous imp implications for, um, for advocacy, what, what we should be doing as, as animal advocates. And, um, and that conversation then led to many other conversations, which led to you and I basically doing all of that work in the early 90s about the rights welfare distinction, which, you know, was, was basically, um, you know, not really being talked about and certainly not amongst the, uh, the animal groups. And, um, and just as now, uh, people don't like to hear about that <laughs> distinction. They didn't like hearing about it then either. And um, we had a lot of great adventures together, Tom. And, um, and, and, you know, when we, when we uh, got the place in New York, uh, one of the things we most liked was um, you and Nancy coming to stay with us. You did it often, and we loved it. And uh, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of adventures together. And I'm sorry that we, um, we ended up uh, uh, parting ways. Um, I'm very sorry about that, actually. And I had always hoped, and I continue to hope, Tom, that we'll... Uh, We'll have some some further adventures together, because um, the uh, the issue things haven't gotten in many ways uh, things haven't gotten better they've gotten worse the the uh, the, the the welfareist ideology is uh, is more pervasive than it was then. Uh, on the other hand, there are people working in the grassroots who reject that more and more of them every single day, and um, so I hope we do have some adventures together, Tom. And I just want to say to you and Nancy that Anna and I uh, really valued and treasure the memories that we have and the times that we had together. Peace to you both. Bye. Hi, I'm David Nybert. I'm a professor of sociology at Wittenberg University. As a professor of sociology in the 1990s, my work against the oppression of other animals was confined to protest and letter writing. Then I discovered Tom Reagan's The Case for Animal Rights. I devoured the book and placed it in the middle of my bookcase. After some time, I felt Tom's book was calling to me, prompting me to bring sociological scrutiny to the terrible treatment of other animals in the same way Tom had examined it through the lens of philosophy. At the time, very few sociological books existed on the topic, and even fewer challenged the horrific treatment of other animals using critical sociological theory. As a result, I wrote my first book on the subject, Animal Rights, Human Rights, Entanglements of Oppression and Liberation, and I've devoted my scholarship to this field ever since. I consider myself one of the countless scholars and activists who have been inspired by the groundbreaking works of Tom Reagan. Thank you, Tom. I'm Jim Mason, uh, author of uh, several books, uh, notably a book entitled An Unnatural Order, 
available at the Lantern. And um, I just want to say that I'm very honored to be invited to reflect on uh, Tom Reagan's work for animals. And by way of disclosure, I should say that Tom and Nancy did award me and the Cultural and Animals Foundation honored me in 1996 with an award, their Outstanding National Activist Award for that year. So let me say that I do appreciate that recognition to this day. I'm very grateful to them for their generosity. And now I would like to nullify any bias uh, because of that award and speak to all the other accomplishments of uh, Tom Reagan and his wife Nancy and their culture Culture and Animals Foundation. Um, I think it's best to be very short and sweet to get right to the point, which is, for me, that Tom is a pioneer, a founder of the animal rights movement. He has championed the rights of animals in his speeches and writings throughout his career. I am honored to have shared the podium with him at uh, many rallies and conferences. I am honored to have marched and demonstrated with him to make our human society wake up to its wrongs against our fellow beings and to join us in action to right those wrongs. Tom Reagan has been the main mover and shaker for animal rights. He and his wife Nancy have tirelessly continued to move and shake through their Culture and Animals Foundation. They have inspired and they have motivated and they have led activism and they have very much enriched and empowered our movement for the rights of animals. I am proud to be able to support their work. Jim Mason. 